Daniel Holmesy, Director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network here at San Francisco City Hall for the 2018 Bay Area Regional Summit on Community Resilience. What an amazing group of people have come together here today to talk about this incredibly important issue with a big emphasis on equity. That's why we have a panel today, an all-star lineup, focusing on advancing equity in our mission of resilience. Leading that panel will be Felicia Thibodeau, Program Manager for Resilient Bayview, Chris Iglesias, CEO of the Unity Council, lead person on Resilient Fruit Vale, Vance Taylor, the Chief of Cal OES's Access and Functional Needs Office, and last but not least, Megan Rohr, Pastor Megan Rohr, She's the pastor for the SFPD and runs a congregation in the Sunset. Incredibly passionate and has an amazing track record for empowering homeless individuals and achieving their resilience goals. Let's take a minute and find out what these true leaders are doing in, to advance their mission and what we can learn and, and onboard into our own individual work. Good morning and thank you. Well, good afternoon actually. And um, thank you for being present. I'm Felicia Tipido. I serve many roles here in San Francisco one as the executive director of IT Bookman Senior Center, the program manager for Resilient Bayview, and I'm the intake coordinator for Healthy Retail. Amazing enough, all of these do work together under the umbrella of serving the vulnerable population, which this panel is talking about engagement into the vulnerable populations, seniors, persons with access and functional needs, and what else do we have? I'm sorry, I could. Anyone that you feel is not able to live its life 100% during before, during, and post disasters are who we consider vulnerable population. And more importantly is, why is it important to outreach to this community? And how do you implement those outreach strategies to become effective during a time of stress? So I'd like my panel to introduce themselves, and then we'll start by asking a couple of questions. Good afternoon. Um, my name's uh, Chris Iglesias. I'm the CEO of the Unity Council located in the Fruitvale District of, Oak, of East Oakland. And I'm just glad to be here um, for a lot of reasons. One, I used to work for the city of San Francisco for 20 years, so I just missed this building and my office was upstairs. And, um, I, and I, but I, I do want to acknowledge, I think Daniel mentioned it earlier, the, um, the loss of uh, Ed Lee, um, or Mayor Lee, who is a, you know, a friend. I worked with him for many, many years. And I was actually, I was looking up some of my notes from 1986, and that's when Willie Brown became mayor, and he was requiring a lot of the department heads to move back in the city, and Ed lived in Oakland. And I was looking for a house, and so he offered, he's like, hey, why don't you buy my house? And I looked at my notes, and, it, and I think he was selling it for like 180,000, three bedroom, one bath house. And, and he goes, I'll give you a deal for like 170 or 160. I'm like, Ed, I'm a compliance officer. I mean, that's like, out, that's outrageous. How could you do that to me? I didn't end up buying it. We ended up finding a place in the city, but yeah, I just, we really miss him. He's a, he was a great man. I'm Pastor Megan Rohr. I'm the pastor at Grace Lutheran in the Sunset. I've also worked with the homeless and hungry here in San Francisco for about 14 years. Um, have done a lot of work and advocacy in the LGBTQ community and identify as transgender. And I'm also a chaplain for the San Francisco Police Department, if that wasn't all enough. Hi, my name is Vance Taylor. I'm the Chief of the Office of Access and Functional Needs at Cal OES. Our role is essentially to identify what are the needs of anybody with a disability or an access or functional need has before during or after disaster. And once we've identified what that is, we integrate it within everything we do in the emergency management systems of California at the state and local levels for their public and private partners. So I'm delighted to be here. So as you can see, we have faith-based LGBTQ, we have homeless, access and functional needs, and also Resilient Fruitvale, which is like Resilient Bayview, we look to act, um, 
explore issues around disasters as well as what happens in community and how we tie all of this together to better serve our community. So the first question I um, have for the panel is what are the benefits of outreaching to the specific um, population group that each of you represent? You wanna start? Sure, so um, you know, we're located in the Fruitvale and I should have probably said a little bit more about the Unity Council. So we're a um, 54 year old social equity development corporation. So we're working with um, children you know, basically prenatal, our, our largest programs are Head Start, early Head Start. So we, you know, we're working with almost 800 families just through Head Start. We have four senior housing developments. So we house several hundred um, low-income seniors throughout the Fruitvale District, um, youth programs, real estate. So we do a little bit of, of everything. Resiliency is um, kind of new to us. And it really started on, I think for us, and the, the, the intention and, and really get into this work on December 2nd, 2016, um, when the ghost ship fire happened. The ghost ship is um, right you know, smack in the middle of the Fruitvale, right next to us. And you know, it really had a profound impact on not only all the folks that lost their lives that night, but I think the Fruitvale in general. And you know, from that day on, it was, um, there was just so much happening in the Fruitvale. And people were coming to us from all kind of different angles about wanting to help and you know, do things and, 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 and kind of, you know, what do you do to prevent this? And the folks that really came first were the Red Cross. And um, I never worked with the Red Cross and those, those folks were pretty intense, right? I mean, they were like really, like they were like overwhelming. And I was just like, whoa, you guys got to just slow your roll and let us kind of breathe a little bit and understand what, how to work with you guys. So I didn't know anybody, but I did know Harold Brooks. And Harold and I, and GL Hodge went on this trip to Israel um, about five years ago. So I, I called Harold right away and said, you know, hey, I, I need some help. I need some advice on how to work with these Red, uh, Red Cross folks. And he's like, well, I'm retired, but I'll still help you. And, and he did. And um, I, like, again, things were happening so fast. I, and I remember like maybe it was probably two weeks after the fire and things were kind of settling down. And I came into work early Monday morning and there was a woman in my office. And I just kind of looked at her. She looked familiar. And then I went to my office and they said, hey, she wants to talk to you. And it, it was Micah, Allison, um, Derek Almany's wife. So the, the, the couple that were like the main t um, tenants or whatever, Manager. managers of the ghost ship. And obviously she was a mess. And you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure how I can help you or what do you need, you know? And she's like, well, um, I need help with our kids. So they have three children. And I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of our specialty. So, you know, children and families and everything. So what do you need? You need a place to, to, to live that would kind of just create normalcy for their kids. Because two of their, their two young ones went to Ascend Elementary, which is where most of our Head Start kids go, so we know it very well. And their eighth grade daughter went to Epic Middle School, where, again, a lot of our families go. So we knew, we, we knew them, and, we, and I, we were able to find them housing, which they ended up not taking. But um, and the next thing you know, they're, they're in our office almost every day. And we were kind of brokering um, the, the partnership with the Red Cross. And Ed was very specific, like, let's do everything at your office. And so it was just, it was learning and learning and learning about that. And then I think soon thereafter, we started getting into the conversations about the resiliency work and, and what we should really look at the fruit fail, the density of the fruit fail. And for us at the time, we were, we were actually getting ready to you know, to, to um, how are we gonna work with our, the new administration as Donald Trump was gonna get ready to start his presidency in January 2017. So that's what we were gearing up for because we knew he was, you know, who he liked and who he didn't like and how he vilified the Latino community and what that meant. So, you know, we were already starting to do a lot of work with our other organizations. And I think um, as the, the resiliency work was introduced. It was like, it was like a very good timing to, to start kind of working with all of our community partners. And I could talk about maybe more of that later. I just wanted to um, preface that, as you said, in the Fruitvale, your resiliency is new to you. Resiliency isn't new to the Fruitvale. You've been a resilient community, talking it and messaging resiliency amongst your constituents is what becomes new. Like in our community, Bayview, we've mastered 
to overcome a lot of barriers to closing of the shipyard, redevelopment. So resiliency is a new to communities, but talking and preparing resiliency as to how we survive post-disaster is what's new. Thank always you. Teach it. Always learning, always, you know, that's right, you're right. You're right. And I think as, as someone who kind of embodies diversity in some of my own ways of being in the world, I think about the ways that we can sit with each other and listen to each other and learn what are the different bathroom needs? What are the different welcome signs that are needed for the front door? What symbols do we need that's gonna make someone understand that it's a food space rather than a whatever um, space? The ways that we can be in conversation with a many, as many diverse types of folk as possible, the better prepared we are for when an emergency decides to happen near us. P communities that already have vulnerabilities, we have the opportunity, maybe this is just a sermon, I preach too much on Sundays, but we have an opportunity to help people in their daily emergencies every single day to practice our skills with people who already have needs and the same need for shelter in a big emergency is the need that a large portion of people have every day of the week. We get to practice feeling less overwhelmed about it. Uh, as a person of faith, I know that sometimes people think my outfit or my haircut or the steeple on a building gives people the idea that I am already prepared regardless of whether or not I did. And so it gives us an opportunity to think about if people of all different cultures and, and expressions and ways of being in the world are going to run to my building thinking I'm prepared for them, what work do I need to be able to do in advance? And the more we lift up conversations like this, it's not gonna change the fact that in an emergency we have to adapt and we have to you know, use the duct tape and the gum that's on hand instead of the cool equipment we thought was gonna have enough battery life. Um, but it's gonna give us the opportunity in some aspects to plan ahead for the things that are within our control or get people in fancy buildings like this to notice the good work that's already happening in neighborhoods and to allocate the funds that will help people continue that good work because they already been doing it with gum and duct tape, right? Yeah. Excellent, so you know, from our perspective, when we talk about engagement on the front end, it makes all the difference in the world. Right, because emergency management, more than anything, is a business of personal relationships. And the worst time in the world to exchange a business card is after the disaster has taken place. And so what we find is that as communities come together and bring stakeholders around the planning table, as they consider one another's needs, understand what the capabilities are of government, what the role of preparedness on the individual side, and on and on and on are, they come to a place where suddenly they're creating a plan that is truly inclusive, and that is enabling the entire community to maintain their health, and their independence, and their dignity, in the aftermath of a disaster. And while that process can sometimes be challenging, the outcome of your plan will be so much greater if you've had those bright people around the table. I, I joke sometimes that uh, I've got daughters and they wanted, to, they wanted to bake. And they asked my wife, hey, can we make something? And she said, yeah, make some brownies. And she gave them the, the recipe and all the ingredients. And my daughters who were young at the time, they didn't understand, well I don't get it because I'm looking at eggs and salt and sugar and all this stuff, but that's not what brownies look like. <laughs> and she said, look, just trust the, trust the process. 
well, you know, they never baked, and so they thought, well, one egg versus two eggs, who cares? It's cool to crack eggs. <laughs> Sugar versus salt, it's both white, who cares? So what they ended up baking up looked very disgusting. Now, as their father, I have some sort of a, a moral or legal responsibility to take the first bite. <laughs> and I looked at my daughters and I said, I, I quit. I can't, no, I can't do this. I don't have that type of resilience in my stomach. <laughs> and so I said well, uh, to my youngest, sweetie, why don't you take a bite and describe it to me? And she took a bite and her face described to me how terrible it tasted. My wife saw a learning opportunity, teachable moment, and said, girls, why don't you go back, but this time, include each ingredient in the proper portion, in the proper order, and mix it up together and see what happens. And they did. And what came out tasted delicious, and I was more than happy to eat my fair share. And that's what I think of when I think about community planning. That if you look around this room, we all have different backgrounds, life experiences, roles, responsibilities. We work with different agencies, groups and organization, in the public and private sector. And yet, when you put us all together, we bake up something tremendous that in this case would, would smell and taste like resilience, uh, which is something we can all benefit from. So that's, that's the benefit of, of engaging people early on. I think that's how you get to be a resilient people. Okay, thank you. Pen over. <laughs> no, that sums up perfectly about why we should engage communities especially of the vulnerable population early, what I hear is we need to plan with people, not for them. And that you have all stakeholders at the table, those who will be directly affected by the benefit by what you're producing, and then that it's di diverse and inclusive of all of those different populations of people and that we come together to talk about how we collaboratively seek fundraising versus competitively be against fundraising. What are some areas to improve, be it from the private sector, the community, or the government sector, in your, um, in your opinion, when it comes to engaging your particular community? Some areas for improvement. All right, well, you just heard from me, so I'll try and give it short. Um, you know, I, I think that we always feel a sense like we're doing good things, and that's important, because a lot of great work is being done. But none of us can really hang that mission accomplished banner, right? There's always more we can do. But, but what I found is that uh, different sectors have, have different areas. So on the government side, I think we have to really get to a point where we understand there's no loophole in the Americans with Disability Act for disasters, right? So, so we have this, this feeling of like, well, we don't have to provide the interpreters or effective communication because it's a disaster and things are crazy. But there is no regulatory relief on that front. You can't go to a Red Cross shelter and say, hey, it's a disaster, so, you know, look, sorry, it's on the the second floor of an inaccessible building. We did what we could, there's a fire outside, what do you want? And so understanding that we're on the hook, not just legally, but morally to do the right thing, how do we plan accordingly to ensure we get there? It's the worst thing in the world to have a disaster and somebody with a disability goes to a shelter and they're told, if you stay here, we don't have the wraparound services to ensure that you can use a restroom or put you in an accessible cot, which means you have no choice but to stay in your chair 
and soil yourself and sit in your own filth until something better comes along or go back to the disaster area. What kind of a choice is that? And yet, when we don't plan ahead, when we don't recognize our own limitations, when we don't accept responsibility for the duties that we do have to take, this is exactly the position people are left in. And it's happened up and down the state at various times. Now recognizing that, I will say, we have worked, I saw Trevor, where's Trevor? There's Trevor, we've worked with Trevor and our friends at the Red Cross. We've worked with our friends at other governmental agencies. I work with many of the people that are in the room right now to ensure that that understanding is where we start. That's our starting point. How do we make everything equal in terms of access so that we can get to a point where there's equality in terms of response and recovery? Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that answers exactly the question, but I would say that we have to start by understanding that there are certain things that we have to do, whether it's a good day or a bad day, and they're regulatory, they're legal, and they're moral, and they all point to the same outcome. Great answer. I'll use an experience from doing kind of S SFPD chaplaincy work, if only to put in a plug for the new community chaplaincy we're working on to get faith leaders sent to 911 calls. Um, for me, one of the biggest difficulties is communicating across lines. Like there might be seven different agencies in San Francisco who would be really great to come to a mass casualty incident to provide psychological first aid or PTSD care, but who's the person in that office who can say go? Who's the person at emergency management who can dispatch them to the the location they need to be at, who's the person who's at the yellow tape of the first responders who can make sure they're cleared to get into the line of where people are in need of care and support, and who are the people who are gonna debrief them afterwards and make sure they don't go home with their own residual trauma, who's gonna feed them, and all of those other issues. And part of that is trying to figure out not only who are all the players in the room, but who answers text but not email, or will only answer their phone on Thursdays, or that has an amazing secretary who can get you lunch with them. And I think communication, because we have so many different opportunities con to connect with each other, also becomes overwhelming. Like, whose inbox stresses them out when they see the number of emails that are in there and triages based on who's going to yell at you first if you don't get their email responded to or is buried in grant paperwork or has to grab a, a binder of all the things they have to keep track of if they step foot at that emergency site because it all has to be documented and my kind of train of thought is do the best you can until someone smarter comes to relieve you. And yet it doesn't feel like that's always possible with everyone's role in the position that you're in. And so if there are ways to fix a communication system, if there was a way to have chains of command that facilitated cooperation, and if there are ways to err on the side of assuming the best in the people who showed up to an emergency, even in retrospect on the news and in a hearing about it and in your boss's office, it becomes a lot easier to be present and help in an emergency if you feel the freedom to be fully in that space particularly if you're a person from a vulnerable community in that job. Right. So, um, like improvements, challenges, right? What can be improved? Yes. Um, I think, so now, now that we've been doing this work, this resiliency work for um, almost a year now, I mean, we had the, I think the press conference on February 25th, and I, I yeah, I want to acknowledge Sam and 
Shantae out in the, in the back there, they're with the mayor's office in Oakland, AmeriCorps folks who've really been uh, great partners in the, um, all of the, the work in the fruit fail. And Dina right here with um, Office of Emergency Services with the uh, Oakland Fire Department. So I think, you know, for us and for our board and our staff, the way we talk about it is like, of all the work that we're doing right now, this could be like the most important work that, that we're leaving for the fruit fail and for all of our partners because we have all of the major partners engaged, the La Clinica, Centro Legal, the different schools and other um, faith-based organizations. So, and everybody's really energized and behind it. Now, a lot of it's falling on us to continue to lead it and it's not something that we really anticipated. So, like, so how do we keep it moving, right? And is that like, you know, corporations jumping in, PG&E or whoever else, um, you know, we're kind of in that stage right now, but the, the thing is we have a lot of energy. I know actually today um, Mayor Schaaf's folks are back in New York and they're presenting the resilient fruit fail work to some potential partners or funders or whatever. So I think, I think that's important, right? And um, they, they want this work to continue. It's important, but how do you, like, how do you figure out a ways um, to, to, to keep it moving. And so those are just kind of some of the challenges that we're kind of working through right now. But I think we, we have some, um, some really, I think, strong possibilities to keep the work going. So some of the takeaways I hear is how to keep the systems or the process moving, how to fix communication systems, and then the equity amongst response and recovery and how we communicate across lines. In that said, I, when I think about Resilient Bayview more in particular to your question is one good thing in San Francisco is we don't go and talk about Resilient Bayview, we bring Resilient Bayview to talk about Resilient Bayview. So because on the ground, those who are on the ground know what the issues are before they happened, they know the issues are as you stand, and they also know the desired outcome of the community, not just the numbers or, or the funding. So always keeping in contact with the posts of the community, because sometimes in politics, Politics, we go where politics go and not where community go. So it becomes a separation versus a continual movement on the progress that the community is looking for, the, looking at the outcome. And um, I wanted to open it up to questions as I know we probably got 15 minutes in case any of the audience have any questions around best practices, um, other opportunities to engage community or solutions to engaging communities. Check, check. QA right now? Yes, Q&A. Hello, yes. Uh, Felicia, I, um, I marvel at the wonderful work that you and Gil Hodge and the other people do in the Bayview, and I um, would like to know the magic, if you could please share that. Um, I think one of the things that we struggle with in our neighborhood is um, complacency. Also, we struggle a lot with how to get people engaged um, it's almost like the message goes out, but it feels like it just goes over a cliff and, and there's no real way. And if you could share your magic with us, I would take it back to our neighborhood and be very happy. Now, you know a magician never shares their magic. Because <laughs> if I share my tricks, I'm gonna have to kill you. You know, um, I could speak for myself and I believe this to be true for GEO is when the community gets sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. We've put on the dog and pony show, we've had the community meetings, you've had the block parties, you've, you've gotten money. The worst part for me is when I came to City Hall and my supervisor said, we put more than two million dollars into your community to address violence and I went to 27 funerals in a matter of three months and I was trying to figure out 
two million dollars, 27 funerals of youngsters 25 years of age or older, all within a three block radius, the money's not getting to the block because there's a stoppage. But when the community gets sick and tired of being sick and tired, they come out of complacency and okay with the status quo. But until the community is fed up, Things just continue on the conveyor belt. No matter how politicians, community leaders, and others see it, until the community is fed up, those who are living with it. A lot of us go in and out of communities, work, or passing through, but when those who are lifelong members moved away maybe, but still vested in the community, when they're tired, change begins to evolve. If people are still operating, I heard, the, I heard the saying, if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. So to me, if the community's not shaking and moving, they're not quite, quite tired of the situation. And, and just to add, I mean, the core tenet of the whole community approach is meeting communities where they are. Right, and that's the part that we always remember. Just because you got a grant and you have six months to implement it, doesn't mean that the community thinks they want to do this in six months, and that you, they're excited you got a grant, but they didn't apply for it, right? So just always temper your enthusiasm for your work by recognizing that that may not be the situation in the community that you're going into at that time, or it may not be their priority. Yeah, I've already got your mic, Daniel. Can you stand up? <clears throat> sure. Then you get to talk. And then I get to talk, okay. So um, my name's Jen Strauss. I work for the Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System. And we're trying to roll this out and Margaret and I are, are working on this. And one of the key things that we keep talking about is you know, how do you make sure the system's accessible for access and functional needs. Um, but my question is, what are your sort of advice, recommendations to make sure that we do this in a conscious way and we don't just have our one token AFN representative that's giving their two cents and we can check off that box and move on? Is there, do we need to be doing workshops? Do we need to have like some sort of certain organizations we should be reaching out to? How do we not? make do a bad job of this I guess basically well you're you're starting from a good place right there's there's a lot of value in knowing that there's certain things we just don't know so how do we get there and, and everybody's starting from the right place in that it's good people wanting to do good things but oftentimes it's on us to empower those individuals right so I would say yeah you're gonna, you're gonna want to reach out to your independent living centers and your regional uh, centers, and your nonprofits, and your service providers. And there's a whole long list. And, and we can provide you with all those folks to, to reach out to, but it's also understanding the, the, the place where we start. Is you're doing early earthquake warning, right? So it's easy to think of yourself as, as a tech provider or a program implementer, but, but, but that's not really what you are. You're not in the business of, of technology. You're in the business of saving lives, right? That's your role, that's your responsibility. That ultimately is your duty and it's saving the lives of everyone in this state, regardless of background or physical or intellectual uh, ability or financial background or which language they speak is their primary uh, language and so in that sense, you have this unique opportunity to be the right person at the right time of the people that you serve. And some of you have heard me tell this story, right? I think I told this one workshop you were at, but my youngest daughter was born, but my wife and I did a silly thing, and I'll say my wife and I, but she called the shots, that's the way it works in my family. Uh, she, she wanted to wait until just before uh, the baby was born to go to the hospital. Because the first time we were there forever, so she didn't want to do that again. Three minutes apart, the contractions were. Finally, my wife says, okay, now, now you may take me to the hospital. 
which is 45 minutes away. <laughs> we were living in D.C. What does traffic look like on a Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning? I could have gotten her there faster if I had carried her on my wheelchair. <laughs> Ultimately, we were stuck. And with tears rolling down her face, she said, oh, we're going to have the baby in the car. And I said, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> right? We all know this guy. He's the guy we see on the news. Well, my instincts took over, and I took off a shoelace, and we made it happen. Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not built for that. So I looked over and saw there was a cop. And we rolled the window down and asked, please, can we have a police escort? My wife, there's a baby, help. And he looked and said, yeah, we don't really do that. And he rolled up his window. And we about died. A few minutes later, probably sensing the desperation from our vehicle, he rolled the window back down and said, all right, I'm gonna give you the escort. I'm gonna flip my lights on, stay on my tail, we'll get through traffic. Next thing I know, we're bombing our way through downtown traffic. Which, as a side note, I will tell you, if you ever have the chance to get a police escort through downtown traffic, do it. It's amazing. <laughs> Told my wife, thank you for this opportunity. She did not seem to appreciate it as much at the time. <laughs> we got to the hospital, and 15 minutes later, my daughter was born. And I think on that story and I wonder how different the tale would be that I might tell had it not been for the right person at the right time in the exact moment of our lives when we needed them most. And that's you, right? That's all of us, we have the opportunities through the work that we're doing right now, through the partnerships we're establishing, through the relationships and the trust that we're building, through the integrated plans that we're working through, to ensure that when people have their worst days, when their lives are literally on the line, our efforts will be the difference. And in that sense, we will have gotten to play that role of the right person at the right time in their lives. And that's about the greatest privilege we can ask for. So it's a great opportunity. I'm glad to be in this boat with you. Amen. I don't know that there can be a part two to that answer because it was very in its entirety. But um, I wanted to also say having people from that community at the table. I had a staff meeting and we were talking about seniors and I looked around and every one of my staff were 25 or I'll say 40 and younger and it dawned on me, they're speaking on behalf of the seniors. Let's go grab a senior too and bring them to the table. And before we could even get the meeting started, they said, who's supposed to read this text? <laughs> and you learn very quickly, without a lot of work, without a lot of planning and brainstorming, what actually works for the vulnerable population by bringing them right to the table. It'll affect even your process of bringing them to the, together, bringing them to the table, because I recognize we were in a conference room that pe people couldn't even slide around by. So it changed our process from beginning and through and through by adding the voice that we were championing our causes for to the table. And I would, I would add to one of my favorite phrases that police officers sometimes say to me is like, your job is to bring God to this scene, which to me is a gift because it means it's not my job to do everything in that space. I'm not the person with the caution tape. I'm not the person who has to deal with the press. I have one focus, and if you look around this space and you see the number of people who are in here partnering on the same work, 
You can't ever have one person trying to represent a whole group if you partner with those organizations whose job it is to help you make your, your project speak to that community. And so the more we do our role the best we can in the way that is ours to do, I think the, the more our resiliency knitted patchwork quilt ends up working well. Right, because then the people most affected are the ones with the microphone and the people who can help you solve your problem can solve it for you. And so if your job is to let us know about earthquakes fast enough, I don't know how to do that math, right? But other people can help you with the parts that maybe aren't in your wheelhouse and that's, you know, get all the business cards you can for when you gotta figure out those problems, but do what's yours. Thank you. If I could just add real quick, I think the other thing um, to, to consider is language, right? I mean, if you're going to come into different communities, you, you know, whether it's Spanish, Cantonese, mom, I mean, there's just a variety of um, different languages that, that need to, to be able to reach. And then um, trust, right? So there's just such mistrust right now. And like, who do they trust, right? So I think even with, with, with my own staff, it's like most of our clients don't, don't really know what we do, but they trust us. How do we know that? They're bringing us their kids every day. They're bringing us their parents every day. You know, so there's this, we have this like innate trust. So if you align yourself with organizations, whether it's, you know, there's a lot of other organizations where at least you're kind of coming th through them because otherwise if you just kind of show up and, you know, you know, there's just, they're, you know, especially in, in today's environment, it's just, especially in like in the Latino community right now, you know, that's just something you really, I think you just have to be aware of. Is there one more comment? Um, question from a gentleman over there. While you, while you go there, Trey, I wanted to um, just kind of end Hello. that. One second, end that conversation by saying, language is can always be a barrier, but in my work with in Bayview, within Visitation Valley, and even in the OMI, I have found I don't speak Chinese. I don't speak. Um, Spanish. I only know how to cuss in all of those languages. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. But um, what I, I have served the vulnerable population of every language because although we, there's a language barrier, when you don't let language or any other barrier separate you. Because love in any language can overcome whether I could speak your characters. What I learned in, in um, doing a taking sign language is your facial expressions, your feeling from your heart, and your emotions instantly lets a person know whether they could speak your language or not, that they're in trouble or that you're here to help. So just also prefacing, language can be a barrier, but when you don't let the barrier of language separate you from helping to save lives, because I'm pretty sure when the earthquake hits or the tsunami hits or the flood, when you're saying get out and get on my back, you're going to be able to overcome the language barrier just with the sheer stricken panic on your face. So facial expressions and, and pure decency, respect, and love for the human man overcomes language barriers. So just wanted to say that. I'm kind of nervous, and my name is Emerson Chin, and I've been a volunteer at Red Cross, and not just Red Cross, but I help the homeless, and I go to Washington, D.C. to advocate for money for the mayor to help people. And today is Wednesday. I go to the church and most holy redeemer cook for the homeless people. And last week, I gave a sleeping bag and uh, uh, raised doesn't matter because when I was in uh, high school, I went to the tough high school with all black kids and I learned, I, I really loved them. So when I respond to fires, sometimes they send me a hundred point and I talk to them. And like some of the parents remember me from boys club and now it's boys and girls club. They helped me out and my family were real poor and I went the job driving the bus, Greyhound bus, Muni, and everything. So I learned how to talk to people. And then at 49er game, 
and I was very nervous. He said, just tell her why you're hard like my scoutmaster said. And I, I can't write, but I talk, and they were very happy about it. And I want to thank you, the special need people, and to help um, the people can walk and all that. And I love everyone, and it doesn't matter what kind. And I even went to Mr. Brook, the Red Cross, to Washington, D.C., to visit him, all the way down to Washington, D.C. And uh, I try to smile. And if you ever come to the Giants game, I work on the elevator and I have my elevator music and just smile, make people happy. Yeah. Thank you for all that you thank do. Thank you. So we want to thank you. Oh, sorry, Daniel. Okay, probably not as much as a question as, as kind of a statement to folks, on, especially on the early warning stuff. Um, it, we have to be all inclusive. We have to remember to be culturally competent as well. And we have to work on our consistent messaging. Um, our consistent messaging is one thing, but we need to be aware of how we're delivering that messaging and using our organizations to deliver that message and sending it in a way that is translatable or interpreted uh, because not everything means the same thing um, in the same way. So I think that's really important um, and making sure we're kind of checking off all those boxes as well. Um, we have several different organizations. One, our local VOAD or our Northern California VOAD, it's Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster that all organizations are welcome to participate in. It's a great networking opportunity for all of our nonprofits. And a lot of those organizations are actually disaster preparedness, response driven and recovery driven. Um, and really to be engaging with those organizations ahead of time. Um, I'm thrilled, Daniel's awesome. And we absolutely love the work that we're doing in the Fruitvale and the Neighbors Helping Neighbors program that we've used um, in our cities of service back in New York, our, our funders for all these different things, because we do make it happen. It was great to see Bob here today uh, as well, because FEMA and our other funding sources that we have are really starting to learn from us and the work that we're doing as a region and really getting the messaging across of that importance of this networking opportunity that we all do, because it's this face-to-face -face that does make the difference ahead of time. Um, and I love your recipe story. That is really, that cracks me up because the recipe is all of the ingredients, right? And we are all of the ingredients in the room. And if we're gonna make something truly um, inclusive and competent when we want to do this work, um, we want to make sure because first and foremost, you know, it's us first, you know, if we take care of ourselves that enables us to help others. Um, and that is the key. We have to be able to help others. So I hope the takeaway um, from today is really bringing yourself and your whole heart to what you do in this work. I've been in emergency management for 28 plus years now. And the most important thing that I do is working with our organizations and our local communities. So if your emergency management is not reaching out to you, reach out to them, find out who they are. I mean, we have folks in the room today, I know Berkeley's here, you know, San Francisco. We know and we all work together on a regional level with this stuff and we are so close partnerships with Red Cross and all of our other response organizations. It really is important. Um, and the Earthquake Country Alliance and the work that we do, I mean, we have regional work groups that we come together to work on this stuff, but we need your input. We need to hear your voices. Um, and like Daniel says, I'm not always the one speaking in the room. I'm gonna have the same problem. He says, yeah, take the microphone. <laughs> so, but it is really important that you all wanna have, be the, the champions in your communities. And you can do that by just coming together and, and just start working together. It doesn't take money. It takes heart. Thank you. Okay, so giving a, a thank, a thanks to Vance and Chris and Megan for being on our panel and for sharing your stories. Thank you for being a great audience and listening and laughing at my corny jokes. But I wanted to end with one final thought is that if in community resiliency, the whole big point, the little point, 
the first point and the last point is community because therein, as we look across the country just over the last 12 and 18 months, yes, FEMA spent a lot of money, and yes, governments and how big Red Cross has been, but if it had not been for communities standing up, nobody else, there would have been nothing to come and save. So when we're looking to how we become resilient, the, our answers lies within community. Thank you.